Hello and welcome to another TLC Tutoring Company Accounting lesson. Um, in the past, we've recorded a merchandising company journal entry video for the buyer and sellers. However, we noticed that some new editions of popular textbooks have been showing things a little bit differently, so we wanted to create an updated video for you. Now, before you use this video, I recommend that you take a closer look at your chapter to see if your textbook uses some particular accounts. The accounts that you are going to want to look for are customer refunds payable and estimated returns inventory. If your textbook uses those accounts, then this is likely the video for you. Otherwise, uh, you might want to take a look at our older video. I will leave that link in the description down below. So this method that we are going to be going over today is kind of a combination of the net method and then something new that we haven't seen in too many academic accounting textbooks. So before you get started, keep in mind that we are still doing journal entries. So those three important rules still apply. We still need at least one debit and at least one credit. Debits will still come before credits and our debits must equal our credits. So let's take a look at these four dates and record the seller entries and then look at these four dates again from the buyer's perspective and record the buyer's entries. So this first one on May 3rd, sell company sells $4,000 worth of more merchandise to bowl company, 210 net 30 FOB shipping point. The cost of the merchandise sold was 2,250. Now we are using the perpetual method here. So we need to do a separate journal entry for the amount that we are selling and for the cost of merchandise sold. Now, since we are using a form of the net method, we're also going to have to take into account this credit term piece over here. So let's just start with our journal entries for the seller. So on May 3rd, we have a customer that is making a sale on account. So our accounts receivable, our asset is going to be increasing for the amount that they owe us. And our sales is also going to be increasing since we, since we made a sale. Now we're also going to have another entry on May 3rd. And this is going to be for the cost of merchandise that we are selling. So we're going to debit cost of merchandise sold, that expense account to record that we have our expense. And we are also going to credit merchandise inventory to recognize that merchandise inventory, this asset, is going down for the amount that we're selling. So now let's talk about numbers. This first entry is going to reflect the sales price. Now keep in mind, since we're using the net method, we can't simply take that 4,000 and plug it in. This 210 net 30 means 2% discount if paid within 10 days. Regardless though, the total amount is paid within 30 or must be paid within 30. So we are going to take this 210, this 2% and assume at all times that yes, the buyer is going to exercise the discount. So in this case, this $4,000 sale is going to get a 2% discount. So we are going to take $80 off of the total sales price. So 4,000 minus 80, the total amount that we expect to receive for this sale eventually is $3,920. Okay, now, the second piece is our cost of merchandise sold. Now, does our cost of merchandise sold get a discount? No, because we are literally recording what we sold or what we originally paid for this merchandise. So that 2,250, that is what we originally paid for the merchandise that we are now selling. So it has already been recorded at its actual amount. So we do not have to do anything different there. All right, on to the next one. May 4th, Bull Company, the buyer, pays $200 to have the merchandise from the May 3rd purchase shipped to them. So in this case, we have our buyer that is paying for shipping. So we need to go back to our FOB and take a look at what FOB we're using. In this case, the terms of the contract were FOB shipping point. And if you remember from class, FOB shipping point means that the buyer is responsible for paying shipping. So if the buyer is paying for the shipping and it's the buyer's responsibility to pay for the shipping, this actually isn't going to be any journal entry for the seller. So we can skip May 4th for now. Now, May 9th, 
We have the buyer returning $1,000 of the merchandise, and it also gives us the cost of merchandise return. Now here's where things get a little different from the prior methods that our textbooks usually used. Instead of using all of our typical accounts, we are actually going to be doing the two accounts, just like we always do. However, we're using some different account names. So in this case, we are going to be debiting customer refunds payable to decrease our payable, that little, almost, it's almost acting like an allowance account, to decrease that amount. And in this case, our credit is going to be to accounts receivable. So remember in the past, what you may have learned in your accounting class so far is that at the end of the prior period, we probably did an adjusting entry to create this customer refunds payable. And it does act like an allowance account. It's almost like a bucket that takes our estimations and holds it. Now that someone is actually returning something, we are going to debit the customer refunds payable to decrease it. And our credit to accounts receivable, that simply decreases it to recognize that our buyer no longer owes us that amount. Now we also need one additional entry as well, and that is for the cost of merchandise that is being returned. So in order to record that merchandise is being returned to us, we must debit merchandise inventory to make it go up. And we must credit estimated returns inventory. Now, just like with customer refunds payable, this estimated returns inventory was created through an adjusting entry. So now that that return has actually been made, we are going to credit estimated returns inventory, that asset, to make it go down. All right now, let's talk numbers. This first one is going to reflect the sales price. The second one is going to reflect the cost. Now, just like on May 3rd, we are going to assume that they are exercising that 2% discount. So when we say that Bull Company returned $1,000 of the merchandise, we are actually saying that Bull Company returned $980 of the merchandise because we're also assuming that that 2% discount will be exercised as well. So $290 is my debit and credit for, or sorry, $980 is my debit and credit for that first entry. And my second entry is going to be simply for the cost of merchandise. 560, 560. So you're noticing a trend here. Whenever we do these entries, the sales price entry, that one has to be adjusted for any sales discount. Anything that was for the cost, what we originally paid for, that one is not subject to the discount percentage. So keep that in mind as you're running through these. All right, and last but not least, on May 13, Bowl Company pays for the May 3rd purchase. So as the seller, what does that mean for us? Well, we are going to be receiving cash. So our cash is going to go up. And they're paying off an accounts receivable to us. So our accounts receivable is going to be going down. Now let's talk about the amount. Originally, this buyer had owed us $3,920. However, they returned a portion of that. So the amount that they owed us went down by $980. The amount of cash that we are actually receiving is 2940 So that is the amount of the cash we received. Now keep in mind when you're going through these that in this scenario, the buyer did pay within the 10-day discount period. So they were eligible to receive that discount. All right, now let's take a look at the buyer's perspective of all this. So on May 3rd, our buyer is purchasing $4,000 of merchandise from Sal Company. Now, keep in mind, the buyer is not going to know the cost of the merchandise that was sold to them because that original cost is only for the seller. For example, when you go to Walmart, you don't walk out of there automatically knowing what Walmart originally paid for that barbecue you just picked up. So we actually, as the buyer, do not know anything about this cost of merchandise sold amount. We only know about the 4,000. So let's journalize this. We are purchasing merchandise inventory and 
we now owe money. So our accounts payable will be going up and our merchandise inventory will be going up. And just for a quick review, merchandise inventory is an asset. We make an asset go up by debiting it. Accounts payable is a liability. We make it go up by crediting it. Now let's talk about the amount. Just like we did with the seller, the buyer is going to assume that they are going to be exercising that discount opportunity and paying within 10 days. So we are also going to be using that 3920 rather than the 4000 because we are going to assume that we are going to get that 2% discount. Now for our May 4th entry, keep in mind that this was FOB shipping point and the buyer was responsible for paying the shipping. Now since the buyer is responsible, they will have to pay this $200 and we will have to do an accounting entry for the buyer. So on May 4th, they pay $200 to have the merchandise shipped to them. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that what the account that we need to use for shipping is going to be merchandise inventory. It will not be an expense for the buyer. And the reason why is this is a cost of getting that merchandise inventory to them and in working condition. So we need that debit to merchandise inventory to record that the merchandise inventory is actually incurring this extra cost and this will be embedded within that asset. And for our credit, again, we're seeing that important keyword pays. What are they paying? Cash, so cash will be going down. All right, next will be the May 9th return. On May 9th, the buyer returns $1,000 of the merchandise. In this case, we simply have a decrease to the amount they owe, so debit accounts payable to make it go down, and a decrease to that company's merchandise inventory. Now keep in mind, whenever we record this, we are going to be using the net method, so we are assuming that they are going to exercise that 2%. So when they say that they return $1,000 of merchandise, they are actually only returning a portion of it. They are returning $1,000 minus the 2% discount. So they're actually, again, only going to be including that 980 for this entry. And last but not least, on May 13th, the buyer is going to be paying for the May 3rd purchase. So again, accounts payable is going to go down since we are now paying off our debts, and cash is also going down since we are paying this off. Now. Keep in mind, what is the current balance in accounts payable? Well, we originally had 3920 in the account. However, we decreased it by 980 when we returned some of the goods. So the amount of cash that we are paying is actually 2940 And you'll notice that this amount actually coincides with what we said the seller was receiving. So the seller is receiving whatever the buyer is paying do have to match up. All right, so these buyer and seller entries can be a little challenging, so I encourage you to practice them as many times as you can. And other than that, if you have any questions, please make sure to leave them in the comment section down below. And if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. So we'll see you in our next video. And in the meantime, happy studying.